We recently asked you which birth or pregnancy topic you most wanted to hear from us, and the overwhelming favorite was how to prevent or limit tears from a vaginal childbirth. Fair. Um, so this week we are going to cover the evidence that's out there about how to prevent or limit perineal lacerations, things you can do leading up to delivery and during the delivery itself. If this is your first time meeting us, I'm Sarah. I'm a board certified OBGYN and just had a baby myself. Yeah, and I'm Kurt. I'm a board certified pediatrician, and, and we, we are, are the Doctors Bjorkman. Welcome back. As we mentioned, this week's episode is all about how to prevent tears, lacerations from vaginal childbirth. Yes. Um, but just in case you aren't, please make sure you subscribe to our channel. Over this past year, we went through pregnancy and childbirth and now parenting ourselves and have yeah. been trying to share as much of that with you as possible. So there actually is data and medical evidence studies have been done um, about things first time moms can do to prevent severe mm -hmm perineal tears. And so we are going to share those kind of top four things with you today, as well as share a couple of the more controversial things um, at the end of this episode. Starting out, about 53 to 79% of women, or most women, mm -hmm. will have some perineal laceration during a vaginal delivery. Yeah. Now, most of these are termed first or second degree lacerations. Mm -hmm. Well, the severe lacerations, third and fourth degree, are those that extend through into the anal sphincter complex. Yeah. Worrying about tearing during your delivery is very common and totally understandable, right? Your vagina and your pelvic floor are very precious things. Um, but I want to reassure you that the vagina is really stretchy, it the folds, allow it to stretch to accommodate that baby. Um, and also it heals incredibly well. Yeah, and there's some data showing that it's able to stretch almost three yeah, times as much to make room for that baby. Yes. But before we get into talking about this anymore, we should cover kind of what these tears are and where they occur. Yes. Okay. Let's first talk about anatomy. So most tears happen here in the vagina and downward um, through what we call the perineal body or this area between the vagina and the anus. Tears can happen elsewhere. You can tear up toward the clitoris, the labia, um, the urethra, but these are not as common. Yeah, and as we've already alluded to, there's a classification system for these tears based on how severe they are. Yes. Uh, a first degree tear is one that just involves the skin or the mucosa and usually doesn't require any repair after. A second degree tear is one that also includes some of the vaginal muscle and is going to require at least a couple stitches. Yes. So a third degree tear, again, involves that vaginal mucosa, the vaginal muscles, and also involves um, the anal sphincter or the muscle that controls your anus. A fourth degree um, involves all of that, plus also involves the rectal mucosa. Um, and these third and fourth degree lacerations are severe injuries that require very careful surgical repair and care afterwards. Mm -hmm. We are going to have a video um, in the coming month about how to take care of these perineal lacerations no matter what type of tear you had, um, so stay tuned for that. Some quick thoughts from an OBGYN about repairs. One, you should know exactly where your tear was and where stitches were placed. Also, you should be comfortable during this repair. If you are not, let your provider know so they can either give you more local numbing medication or even increasing the dose of your epidural to make you more comfortable. You should absolutely not be jumping off the bed in pain. So now let's talk about some things you can do to prevent or at least limit uh, perineal lacerations. Okay, so just as you can imagine, an elite athlete would stretch their muscles before competition. The same concept is true of the vagina and your kind of perineal muscles, right? So this is called perineal massage. Yeah, and perineal massage is just kind of what it sounds like, either done by yourself or with help from your partner, stretching the vagina and those perineal muscles uh, in the weeks leading up to delivery and also during labor. Yes. 
We've included a really nice guide um, from the UK's National Health Service, um, and it's linked in the show notes below. So looking at four scientific studies um, of nearly 2,500 women who compared those who used perineal massage versus those who did not, they found that first-time moms who started doing perineal massage from 34 weeks onward had a lower risk of having a tear that required stitches and had a lower risk of needing an episiotomy. And then the use of perineal massage during labor and that pushing or second stage of labor has also been studied. Mm -hmm. An analysis of two studies looking at this process found that those women who had perineal massage during second stage of labor were about half as likely to have those severe third or fourth degree tears. Um, the studies did not show any statistical significance in the difference of those less severe first or second degree tears. Yeah. All right, so perineal massage. We started this at about 34 or 35 weeks. Kurt absolutely had to help because I couldn't reach. Yeah. Um, he wasn't really excited about it, but I, like all of you, was very terrified of my vagina ripping. Um, and so I was gonna do absolutely anything I could to try to stretch and prepare for birth. Yeah, and I would, I would agree, I wasn't really a big fan. <laughs> Didn't um, love it. Didn't but, you know, we're a team, and I wasn't the one actually carrying the baby and wasn't going to have to actually go through childbirth. Yeah. So, so he stepped know, up. Being a team member was the least I could do. Um, you know, it definitely added some intimate and memorable moments to our pregnancy journey. So um, if this is something you're thinking about, just tell your partner they've got to do it. Yep. Because that's what happened with us. Yes, it is. Using a warm compress during active labor is something else that you can do to help limit the risk of severe tears. So an analysis of two studies of over 1,500 women found that applying a warm compress, so a warm wet washcloth to the perineum uh, during the pushing stage of labor significantly decreased the risk of third and fourth degree tears, cutting the risk in about half. It did not increase the chances of having a completely intact perineum, so no tears at all, um, but it did decrease the chance of having those severe lacerations. The use of different birthing positions gets a lot of hype. Um, some of that is for good reason, and we are gonna make an episode on different positions, um, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, but when it comes specifically to using birth, different birth positions and preventing tears from childbirth, yes. the data is mixed and somewhat limited in that there's no clear benefit from one position over another. Um, so with that, we work with your OB, work with your labor nurse to find the position that's gonna be most comfortable and effective for you. So as Kurt said, the studies on pushing is limited in quality and quantity. However, looking at more than 22 studies with 7,000 women, they did find that women who pushed in an upright or lateral position were less likely to need an operative delivery or an episiotomy, but were more likely to have a second degree tear. That being said, another randomized control trial, they looked at five randomized control t trials of women who had epidural anesthesia, and they found no difference um, between those who pushed in a lateral position versus lithotomy. Yeah, another recent randomized trial compared women who pushed in a lateral position with delayed pushing as compared to women who were in the lithotomy position mm -hmm. or on their backs with pushing at complete dilation mm -hmm. did find that women with a delayed pushing on their sides were more likely to deliver with an intact perineum being 40% as compared to only 12% in that other group of women pushing on their backs. Delayed pushing is certainly something you will hear about when you are investigating ways to try to prevent tearing during childbirth, but there isn't a lot of strong data to back this practice up. Yeah, there's been a systematic review looking at kind of nine studies of almost 3,000 women comparing those who pushed within one hour of getting to complete yep. or those who waited one to three hours after getting to complete dilation and found no significant difference in the rates of perineal laceration or episiotomy between these two groups. Yeah. As an OBGYN though, I have to say that there is something to be said for control as you are in those final moments of delivering your baby. So when you are feeling that ring of fire because baby's head is right there, it is so important that you control your pushing and control your breath um, because 
controlling that final delivery will help prevent tearing. Your OB can help you and guide you through this by telling you kind of little pushes, you know, control your breathing, and they can also kind of help by supporting your perineum and making sure those little flailing arms stay in on their way out so they don't cause any extra stretch. So I ended up with a first degree and then a labial laceration. Um, my first degree did not require stitches. Um, the labial lac did, um, and that actually ended up kind of being a pain uh, because my stitch didn't dissolve. And at about four weeks postpartum, I had this little labial abscess. And I also that same night, like had a clogged duct and I was just totally miserable and was just kind of like, ah, I'm not having fun. Motherhood sucks. Like nobody tells you about this. Um, anyway, it all resolved um, with a little help from my OBGYN. Um, but things I felt that helped me were definitely, as we talked about, doing the perineal massage pretty religiously starting at 34 or 35 weeks. Um, also, I felt like having the epidural really helped me with control at the end. Um, and those little pushes at the end really was, thank goodness. Um, also the epidural, I remember asking the OB if I had any tears and if she was gonna fix it and she was like, I'm done, didn't feel a thing. So loved the epidural for that as well. As for postpartum, um, things that really helped me were sitting on ice packs, um, using my peri bottle religiously, Tylenol and Motrin around the clock. Um, and again, these are all things we're going to go through in an episode all itself on how to take care of perineal lacerations. And as promised, we want to cover a couple more controversial topics and options for potentially preventing or limiting tears in childbirth. So the first of these is something called an episiotomy. And that is when the OB makes a cut in the vagina to make room for baby and potentially limit or direct where the tearing happens. We aren't going to go into this much today other than to say that episiotomy is something that ACOG does not recommend being used routinely, though there may, it may be appropriate in certain instances. So the practice of episiotomy is something you should talk to your OBGYN about wh what they do and their thoughts on that. The other controversial option we're going to talk about today mm -hmm. are birth training devices such yes. as the EpiNome. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are special inflatable balloons uh, that are actually used and inflated in the vagina to help stretch the vagina in the weeks leading up to delivery. The thought process here is that over those weeks, uh, that mom-to-be can practice inflating that balloon to increasing sizes to both help stretch the vagina and then also help prepare her for that intense sensation of crowning. It is really important to note that the EpiNo and other such devices are not FDA approved in the United States, nor are they even for sale in the United States. Um, and that's because there is a case report of a woman who was using um, a balloon like this and was inflating the balloon into her vagina and there was a hole in the balloon. Mm -hmm. um, over the course of five to 10 minutes of her continually inflating air through this leaking balloon, yes. it caused that air to enter the bloodstream, causing a severe illness that was almost life-threatening to her. Yes, so because of that, it's not for sale in the United States, it's not FDA approved. And so if you are using one of these birth training devices, make sure you are following the device specific instructions very carefully and make sure you are testing the integrity of that balloon before use. To summarize all the things that have some data to back them up about limiting or preventing tears from childbirth, yeah. uh, the first is starting with perineal massage at that 34 to 35 weeks of pregnancy mark. Yes. Um, the next things you can do are to apply warm compresses to the perineum during labor and again to continue with that perineal massage, either your partner or your OBGYN while you're pushing. Yeah, there wasn't great data to support any specific pushing position mm -hmm. over another. Um, so work with your OB provider to find the position that's going to be best and most effective for you. 
and work with your OB provider or your doula or your midwife to help you find control for those last pushes when delivering your baby. That is all we have for you this week. I hope that these tips help you to prevent um, some of those severe lacerations during mm -hmm. birth. Know that you can do it and your bottom will be okay. Stay tuned with us for upcoming episodes about how to take care of your bottom after you have a perineal laceration, episodes about infertility, car seat reviews, and all sorts of other parenting things. Yeah, so make sure you're subscribed. Look forward to seeing you guys back next week. Bye. Bye. We're doctors. But not your doctors. Anything we've said in this video is for education or entertainment purposes only. It is not medical advice. Any specific medical questions you have should be directed to your provider.